Welcome back to my channel. So excited to have you, Wendy Renee here with another awesome interview. Today I'm interviewing Ashley Easter. She is the founder and president of the nonprofit organization known as Courage 365. It is specifically for people with religious trauma and those who have been through what we have been through. Before we begin, I want to thank you so much for liking, sharing, and subscribing to this channel. Like I always say, it just goes to show that there is hope and positivity on the other side of high control religion, cults, and narcissistic abuse. And if you are a survivor of any of those things, you are welcome here. And just know that if you're just waking up, we've been there. You're going to be okay. We promise. Stick around for a little while. Watch some of the other videos, listen to the other stories, and you may find yourself resonating with the other people who have graced this channel with their presence. Thank you so much for being here and let's talk to Ashley. Ashley, thank you so much for coming on the show. We are so excited to have you. I, I want to know all about Courage 365 and how you got there. Just take it away and start from the beginning. Well, thank you so very much for having me on the show. I'm I'm really excited. I think we were connected through our mutual friend, Andrew. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, really excited to chat with you today. Um, I do have a nonprofit called Courage 365 for abuse survivors, but for that even was anything in my mind, I think I should probably go back and tell a bit of my story. Um, yeah, so I actually grew up in a cult, um, and as is common with cults, they have their own kind of like insider lingo. So to describe what happened, I have to describe some of the words that they use in the cult. So stop me if something doesn't make sense, but I'll try to explain how it was laid out because it's it's bizarre and uh, yeah. You're in good company. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Well, the first thing I was involved in um, from the time I was a couple days old was m both my grandfathers had churches that they pastored um, in the independent fundamentalist Baptist church denomination. And people might be familiar with that denomination. There's been a lot of um, news articles that have come up about a lot of abuse in those denominations in the past few years. The Star Telegram did a huge expose. Um, but they were pastors of different churches. One grandfather was in the north, the other one was in the south, and I grew up in the south um, in Lynchburg, Virginia, which is Jerry Falwell town, if anybody's familiar with him. <laughs> um, and it was a very strict church. So like, I think it was the church bylaws. Um, it, you basically had to agree like no dancing, um, no drinking. There was like um, really strict gender roles. Women were not able to have positions of leadership over men. Um, and a lot of just odd things like, you know, not going to movie theaters was very common and um, just a very isolated environment. But that wasn't the only thing I was involved in. So that was my major source of community. But then in addition to that, I was homeschooled. And so homeschooling is a very broad movement and it can be done well. It can be done very poorly. Some people homeschool their children for really legitimate le reasons. Like um, a lot of Olympic athletes are homeschooled so they can hone their craft. I know a lot of LGBTQ children are being pulled out of public schools so they can be homeschooled and maybe a safer environment if their school isn't safe for them. Um, some people do it because their child has disabilities and they want to give them particular help and support. So there are a lot of reasons and ways it can be done well but there's also this kind of dark side to the homeschooling movement and the homeschooling movement in the u.s really started around a lot of political and um, extremist ideology around taking children out of schools and only having them be taught at home for religious slash maybe political reasons and so my family was more in that type of religious reasons for homeschooling camp. And so you have the homeschooling movement and then inside of it, there's these smaller movements. And one of those smaller movements was called the patriarchy movement. And that was something that we were a part of. And it is, it, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's about adherence to the patriarchy. So men are to have power and control over women in the home, in the church, and society. A man's job is to take care of the family by being the main breadwinner, the main decider of all things important. And a woman's role is to get married young, have 
lots of babies, say yes to sex, submit to her husband, and really homeschool her kids, generally speaking. So there's the homeschooling movement. Inside of that is the patriarchy movement. Well, there's another movement inside the patriarchy movement. So it's kind of like those Russian nesting dolls, like the Matryoshka dolls, where like they all kind it's of go in. It's a exception is what it sounds yes. like. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So inside the patriarchy movement is a movement called the Quiverful Movement. And that movement was very popularized by um, the Duggars, 19 Kids and Counting TV show. Um, there's a newer show called Welcome to Plathville that was very quiverful. Um, and so that's kind of the closest pop culture example I have to that. But basically, Quiverful is taking this scripture out of context in the book of Psalms. And the verse goes something like this. Children are like arrows in a mighty man's quiver. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. So to be a blessed man, you should have a quiver full of arrows, arrows meaning children. And I remember as a teen sitting through a lecture about the 200 year plan for the quiverful movement. And have you heard the 200 year plan? I, I haven't, but. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses have a thousand year and then oh gosh yeah eternity plan so 200 years okay like a lot <laughs> yeah yeah something with cults and having like number of year plans anyway <laughs> um so the 200 year plan is this you have 10 kids those 10 kids have 10 kids those 10 kids have 10 kids and on and on and on your friends are doing this for 200 years and this movement will have this astronomical amount of descendants that all be like these little arrows shot out into the world to sink into different sectors of society like the home the church schools government media um, music industry all these different things and you will dominate the world through overpopulation and with this patriarchal message Clear so that's not. the 200 year plan <laughs> So um, homeschooling movement, mm -hmm. patriarchy movement, mm -hmm. quiverful movement, that last little doll in the Russian nesting doll set is another movement I was a part of called the stay at home daughter movement. And the stay at home daughter movement is kind of taking this idea of if in the patriarchy movement, adult married women are supposed to submit to their husbands and everything what do we do with unmarried adult women? We can't just have them run around not submit, submitting to anybody. I mean, that would be a travesty for them to think for themselves. So we will have them submit to their fathers until they're given away in marriage to another man that they submit to for the rest of their life. And in the meantime, they'll focus on homemaking skills, obeying their father. He'll have oftentimes control over what they wear, what their relationships are like, when and if and who they marry. Um, a lot of stay-at-home daughters did not go to higher education. I had the opportunity but didn't go. Um, and it's really kind of a, a movement of where you're preparing to be that perfect wife to step into your role in the quiverful movement to have those many children and homeschool them and then to keep this cycle going. So that is the cult I grew up in. Uh, there's multiple layers. And um, when I was very young, like three or four, I felt like something was wrong. And my intuition was just like, this doesn't feel right. And also it's very, um, developmentally common for a young child to want to start um, being a little bit independent when they're young and trying to kind of have their own thoughts. And this was always seen as rebellion. And so my questioning of the system, the things of going on, the way I was being treated was labeled rebellious. And in the movement, rebellion means like the sin of witchcraft. Witchcraft means alliance with the devil, alliance of the devil means you get cast into hell. And so like this, this intense shame on top of other forms of abuses that really just silenced my intuition and brought me into this point of submission. I ended up while I was in the movement embracing it and um, I actually had a blog called Stay at Home Daughter when I was a, a teen and it was about adherence to the patriarchy, how to be a submissive woman, all of those things. And I ended up getting into a relationship. Uh, we called it a courtship versus dating. And so there was a lot of parental control and uh, the relationship ended up being abusive. And 
It was abusive to the point where I was able to see a distinction between what I was already experiencing and how intense this relationship was. So keeping in mind, like it's already a toxic environment, but being in this relationship, there was like even a contrast there. And so thankfully I was able to get out of it before we got married. But as is common with people who experience abuse, uh, I went through post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. So. I had the panic attacks, the flashbacks, the nightmares, the suicidal thoughts, the depression, the anxiety, just all of those things flooding into my body, just overwhelming me after I experienced this abuse. And it was one of the darkest times of my life. And I'm honestly glad to still be alive today because there were times when I wasn't sure if that was the option I was going to choose. And kind of the tipping point in my story was I had such a hard time sleeping because the PTSD was so bad, I would wake up with panic attacks and I would have nightmares about what had happened. And if I was awake, I would also feel panicky and anxious and it felt like I just couldn't escape. So I would stay up really late at night, just trying not to sleep, but also not to think. And I put in headphones and turned up the music really loud just to try to drown out the sound of my own mind. And in that moment when I was trying to suppress my thoughts, suppress my anxieties, that's when my intuition came back through really clearly. And I heard this voice in my head and it said, it's gonna be okay, something big, something good's about to happen. It's gonna be okay, something big, something good's about to happen. And sure enough, um, not too many months later, a woman who briefly visited our church and was like, this is not for me, <laughs> good for her. She figured that out sooner than I did. Um, she invited me to a coffee shop where she worked. When I went there, she introduced me to this guy who was also Christian, but a bit more, a lot more liberal than I <laughs> had been. He was still like conservative Christian, but um, he believed in equality for women. And when he asked me what I did, I was like, well, I'm a stay-at-home daughter. And he's like, you're a, you're a what? <laughs> stay-at-home daughter right. <laughs> biblical femininity and all that jazz and he's like uh, like he he was just like kind of in shock a little bit and so he started asking me about my belief systems and at first I became a bit defensive because I'm like oh he's trying to lead me astray lead me to the dark side these evil feminists and you know all this stuff um and I tried to kind of like stop some of the conversation and everything, but he kept reaching out to me on Facebook, kind of poking at me with these questions that I didn't know the answers to. And I finally realized that I'm gonna have to debate this guy. And the stereotype is true. Uh, homeschoolers are notoriously good debaters. So I was like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm gonna have to prove to him why women need to submit to men, which I realized the irony in that now did not <laughs> at the time. Um, but I began researching and studying equality for women from a theological standpoint, from a sociological standpoint, from a safety standpoint, all these things. And to my shock and surprise, like I was coming at it to find what his weak points were so I could kick his legs out from underneath him in the argument. but the debate didn't have to happen because the research convinced me. I was like, wow, I've been lied to my whole life. Mm -hmm. I am an equal human mm -hmm. and I get to make my own choices. So to prove him wrong. Yeah. That's when you started your wake up. It was. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was coming at it, like trying to be like, no, this isn't true. Um, I'm a pastor's granddaughter. I write this blog. I've, re I've read all the books and theology about why women should submit. And then when I am faced with this research, I'm trying to look for the holes and I can't find the holes in it. And I'm like, whoa, this is actually poking holes in my ideology. And I'm realizing that this was a big scam just to control me. And so from there, everything started falling apart because when you pull out that patriarchy piece, you can no longer be a stay-at-home daughter. You've got to make your own choices about who, when, if you date and marry. Um, I didn't feel like I could keep going to that church. Um, my relationships with my family were going to have to change, and it was terrifying for me. from the truth that I was an equal person and I needed to start taking some responsibility for my life and family was not pleased 
people in the church were not pleased, um, whole nine yards. Um, but I began becoming really rebellious. I started swing dancing and listening to Taylor Swift with the bass up. <laughs> so, oh super God. rebellious. <laughs> Can we cut that out in editing? Okay. <laughs> No, not Taylor Swift. No. Oh my God, Taylor wow. Swift. And uh, I even went to the movie theater and saw my first movie was Son of God. So it was like a movie about Jesus, but I'm like sneaking there. My friends, I'm like telling them, don't put this on Facebook that I'm here. I, nobody can know I'm at the theater seeing this movie about Jesus. You know? oh so, so um, mm -hmm. I started traditional dating, making my own choices. I quickly... Um, met my now husband, Will Easter, and he was the one who physically rescued me from the cult by us getting married. Um, we It kind of gives a new meaning to the getaway car um, that you leave after the wedding, and from there my life really changed. I was in a safe place getting help with quality therapy um, and really beginning to understand more of what had happened to me and the connection between this um, patriarchy, power and control, and abuse, understanding that my intuition was something that I really can and should trust. And I started writing about some of my experiences. And this is when kind of the beginnings of my nonprofit really started developing. So as I was talking about some of the things that ex I had experienced, I had hundreds of survivors reaching out to me saying they'd experienced similar things. They'd experienced them in faith and religious environments. They'd um, had people shun them. They'd had people cover up abuse. And the common thing that I heard from, from everyone is they felt like they were alone. But I knew that they weren't because hundreds of people are telling me the same thing. So I was like, okay. And that's when my intuition told me, um, you need to start this event. And we called it the Courage Conference and had that in 2016 where we had a sold out event. People were streaming online live, people were there in person. And we just got survivors together in a room. And for the first time, a lot of people were like, wow, I'm really not alone. And we had empowering speakers, survivors sharing their stories, mental health professionals, legal experts, and um, that event continued to grow and expand. And we did it year after year um, until the pandemic hit. And right around that time, we were also forming it into our own nonprofit before we then kind of a project under another nonprofit. And um, with COVID, we ended up turning it into an online event that we now call the 30 Days of Courage. And so that happens every October 1st through the 30th. And we have speakers throughout the month. We've had people like Leah Remini from Scientology in the Aftermath. We've had people like Jonathan Sheck. Um, we've had Harvey Weinstein and um, Bill Cosby survivors. Um, this year we have a Hollywood intimacy coordinator talking about consent and relationships and um, Noemi Rebe, who is on that amazing um, Hillsong church cult documentary on Discovery Plus and, and other people. And during the 30 days, we not only have these speakers that are live streamed into the group where you can access them and ask questions. We do like Q and A's after the talks, but then we have self care challenges and prizes and support groups. And so that's kind of like our main event for the nonprofit. But during the year we have a weekly live stream sh or weekly show slash podcast. Um, and we have free resources that we've created for survivors. And it's really been one of those things where I experienced so much pain in my past. And one of the hardest things of coming out about what had happened to me was lack of support, um, lack of access to um, the community that I that I wish that I had. And so that's what we've created with this event with this nonprofit and um so that's what that's what we do um on the side i you've heard me mention intuition a lot i also have an intuition coaching business where i teach people the science and practice of intuition because i learned that it's not just a feeling there's like a science and like these brain hacks you can use to make quality intuitive based decisions instead of fear-based decisions so i do that and um it's really developed into this life of 
what I hope is service to other people and what I see, whether it is helping people trust themselves and their intuition or whether it is having these events for survivors, kind of being anti-cult and <laughs> giving people the, the tools to help them really make their own choices, get safe and have community and resources that weren't available when I was first coming out. But what I would say is different with Courage 365 and the 30 Days of Courage from something like a Jehovah Witness group put on by the church. Mm -hmm. um, or I've worked with a lot of advocacy for helping abuse survivors coming out of the Southern Baptist Convention and Southern Baptist Convention will put on like a survivor event or something like that, which is generally trash because they are doing it to like pat themselves on the back and be like, oh, see, we're helping survivors when behind the scenes they're really not. Um, so one thing I would say is the distinction between um, where the power is and what the intention is. So in the church sponsored events, um, generally they're doing that as a reaction to bad press and it's a way to try to fix their image, an attempt to fix their image. And the stories and the tools and information given at those church sponsored events are going to be something that's not going to go against the organization. It's going to be something that is actually going to deepen people in the organization and give them a excuse maybe not to leave or for people who are critical to be like, oh, well, they had the survivor events. Maybe they're getting better. Um, so I think a lot of times the intent with powerful organizations like that is wrong. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is we really believe at Courage 365 that survivors are the experts. And so while we do try to bring in people who um, are experts in their fields, like we have this year a forensic psychologist who's going to talk about um, male survivorship, we also have people who are just survivors sharing their story. And we really try to highlight people who reflect what our audience looks like. And that looks in many different ways, but we try to reflect our demographic, um, people, um, not just white people, not just white women, but people of color, you know, we've had male survivors, you know, all those types of things. But we're even creating a resource. I'm really excited about this, and I think it may answer your question. Um, we're creating a resource that'll be coming out in October called What I Wish I Knew Before I Left. Mm -hmm. And Maureen Garcia, she's the author of that um, creation for our nonprofit, and it's going to be an ebook. And on the front end of the ebook, all of the expert advice is coming from survivors. And a lot of these survivors do not have degrees in these types of things. They don't have platforms. Mm -hmm. These are just, we pulled our audience and we're like, what do you wish you knew before you left abuse? What were things that would have been helpful? We asked a variety of questions and we really believe that survivors are the experts. Now the second half of the book, we have the quote unquote traditional experts, but we list how all of those traditional experts have said that the true experts are the people who've experienced it, not the people who've studied it in a book and that they have valuable things to teach because studies are important, statistics are important, but those experts point to the survivors as being the real experts. And I would say that's how we approach our resource creation, that's how we approach our events, and this isn't about a power structure, this is about community, and if somebody comes to one of our events and decides this is not for them, there's no hard feelings. That's like right, everybody right. experiences healing in different ways. And so we offer something that has resonated with a lot of people, mm -hmm. but it's not a system where if you don't attend this event, we're not gonna allow you to have access to our free resources. Or if you don't attend this event, that means that you aren't gonna get on your healing path. Like this is a creation that we know has helped people, but we also respect the autonomy of the survivors to choose their own healing path. I can respect that so much. There is so much power in storytelling. Most of my channel, most of what we do here, it's about is, it is the stories where we find each other. 
you know, Mm -hmm. because when you're waking up from high control religion or a cult, you think you're the only one because you're programmed and conditioned to think that you're the problem. And like you speak, we push that intuition down. And I don't know if it was the way for you, but for, for this particular cult, your intuition is Holy Spirit. So if you feel a certain way, that's the spirit. That's not your natural inclination and your body talking to you. So when we go through these things, it's amazing how many people on the Jehovah's Witness activism side have woken up just from seeing survivors tell their stories and speak mm-hmm. out. When you realize you're not alone, that's not to invalidate your own experience. And that's not to right. say everybody's just like you. No, it's to say, yeah, you're not alone. We get it. We 100% get it. And so I think that this is wonderful that what you're doing and if people want to be part of 365 survivors or activists, where can they find you and what are some opportunities you may have to help out the um, other religions as well? Yeah. So with Courage 365, we are not affiliated with a religious group. Um, We have people who identify as Christian, people who don't identify as Christian, people who are atheists on our board. You know, this is not a religious thing. However, and we do provide resources that help everyone who's experienced abuse. However, um, a lot of us have experienced it in faith environments. And so that's always sort of an underlying thread of like, we know this happens everywhere. And also there's a special need for people who have come out of high control religion and cults. Um, So on our website you can just go to courage365.org and then the top tab there it says 30 days of courage or if you want to go directly there and share it it's courage365.org slash the word 30 and that tells you all about the free event and it is free like you just you go there you sign up you get inside a facebook group not charging people for this but then there's other things on the website like we have a, a need help tab where it's got tons of resources um, that people can reach out to other organizations. And we're always looking to add to that. So, um, you know, I'd be interested after this conversation if you have suggestions for that. And I want to have like that private conversation. But um, we we have other tools. Like one of our um, tools we created last year is... um, they're called the courage cards and it's an ebook slash video that you can go through to learn how to use these flashcards and on the flashcards are different trauma reducing tools because sometimes when we're in the midst of a panic attack you can't be like hmm what should i do to alleviate this like your mind is just not in that state yes yes Mm -hmm. but if you've read this mini ebook watch this video and know how these different tools work. And then you have these printable cards you can put in your wallet, purse, bedside desk, and you're feeling panicky and you pull them out and you're like, oh, I can do this breathing pattern. Or, oh, this is um, an option for me right now. This one doesn't resonate, let me flip to another one. Or, you know what, I'm not even in that place where I can do this myself. Let me give this to my partner or friend who is realizing that I'm panicky and they can be like, hey, you know, last time you used this tool and it really helped. Uh, So we've got free stuff like that that I really think can apply to anybody um, across religions. And um, we've had conversations uh, with people from um, the Mormon um, church, we've had from Southern Baptist, we've had from um, Independent Fundamentalist Baptist, we've had, you know, just charismatic like all kinds of churches and I I know in our show um the courage conversation show we've had a um conversation specifically with a man who left the Jehovah's Witness religion and so we try to provide those resources as much as possible to people wherever they're at um and our experiences will be different based on our backgrounds but a lot of the things that we need for healing are often very much the same. We need supportive community in some shape or form. Most of us need therapy. I love therapy. Um, (laughs) And a lot of us need tools for mitigating trauma triggers. And so those are the types of things that we provide um, as well. And having those resources before something happens and say, you know, it's really important to have tools when you're bright, when you're feeling well, to, yeah. to get the help when you're feeling well, that way, when things go dark and when you're feeling triggered or upset in any way, you have those tools right there. Yeah. So I, I would just say, um, two things that I've learned 
in my healing journey. One is that you can always trust your gut. You can always trust your intuition. It's important to know the difference between your intuition and fear, ego, trauma, those types of things, because it can get confusing at times. But knowing the difference between that and your intuition speaking, your intuition's always going to guide you to safety, to love and expansion. And that's always going to look like freedom and away from cult like communities away from abusive situations and it's going to be good for you and it's going to be good for other people intuition is so good about doing what's right for you but also for the good of the planet at the same time um and if you have any hang-ups around listening to intuition listening to that voice inside um like you'd mentioned you know some people call it the holy spirit and in my tradition some people call it the holy spirit as well I don't care what people call it at the end of the day, as long as they listen to it. But one of the things that I've seen go wrong with calling it Holy Spirit or, you know, whatever religion you're in, intuition goes by so many different names in different cultures and religions, is make sure that you realize that other people who don't follow your religion and maybe call it by a different name also have access to intuition. And one of the things that I heard growing up, and I'm not sure if this is a Jehovah's Witness thing, but I always heard the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Um, that's not talking about your intuition. That's talking about ego and fear. And so don't let anybody tell you that because your intuition or the quote unquote voice of the Holy Spirit or whatever they, they're calling it at that time, don't let them say that you heard your intuition wrong because it doesn't fall in line with their doctrine, their book, their cult ideology. You know for yourself inside what that voice is. And no matter what anybody else is saying, pay attention to your gut. It will lead you in safety. Um, and then just lastly, I would say um, community has been huge for me. Um, I would not have been able to get this far along in my healing journey if I had not experienced supportive community. That doesn't mean perfect community, mm -hmm. but supportive community. Mm -hmm. And that's what we offer with Courage 365. That's what's happening for the 30 Days of Courage is we have supportive community. Yes, there's those fantastic speakers. Um, Yes, there's the self-care challenges and the prizes, but we also have peer support groups and inside the Facebook group is so much supportive community. And so I would just offer that it's not perfect community, but it is supportive community and we're doing our best to create resources that really help you go further in your courageous journey through healing and so you can sign up for free it's october 1st through the 30th you can drop in any time um, and go to courage365.org the one thing i did want to mention to you is i love that you talk deeply about intuition because most of our audience right now um and i and i know this mainly because i i speak to people behind the scenes and mm -hmm. we have people who create aliases we have people who are learning uh about their religion that they thought that they knew their whole lives yeah. and they're kind of hiding under the covers especially women yeah. they're hiding under the covers you know when you are taught that your intuition is the holy spirit or you're correct whatever it was called when your intuition is guiding you to do things that are contrary to the doctrine contrary mm -hmm. to what you were taught you really start to second guess that intuition because you haven't been learned, you haven't taught, been taught to yeah. trust it. And it hasn't been calibrated according to what you personally think is right, not what you've been told to think is right for yourself. So just a quick message to somebody in the audience who fits that description, who is, is this the right thing for me? Is this the true religion? I'm in the state of crisis. What is something you would say to that person who isn't even calibrated to trust their intuition at this point? Well, two things. There's a science behind intuition. It's not just a feeling. There's actually neuroscience, um, psychology behind intuition and studies and research that show that it is much more accurate than just your regular logical brain. Something I like for people to to lean into is knowing the difference between intuition and ego fear trauma. Um, ego fear trauma, all of that is going to feel 
um, urgent. It's going to feel very hectic energy, like hyper energy. It's going to feel like, should I do this? Should I do that? I don't know. I don't know. It's going to feel like outside information and just like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's going to feel... Um, like it's coming from a place of fear, staying safe, playing small, being inside the comfort zone. Intuition is going to feel calm, cool, clear, concise. It's going to be pointed. It's going to be accurate. It's going to be unwavering. It's not going to use fear to get your attention. You may feel fear about what it says, but its actual voice isn't going to try to scare you. And when you feel those things, when you feel that I don't know how I know this, but for some reason I know I need to ask this question or this isn't right for me or um, it doesn't make sense, but I've got to take the leap and go this direction. When you feel those things and they're separate from either strong desire or strong fear, that's when you know it's your intuition speaking and there's so many studies and science behind why it's accurate, why you can trust it. I've really found that that helps weed out the difference between is this something I can trust or not. Wow. I, I think you just cleared that up for me and I'm sure for those of you that are watching this, the difference between intuition and what was it that you said? Um, um, I call it ego, but it can be like, I don't mean ego as in you're being egotistical, but more just that part of your brain that's about fear, trauma, instinct, um, all that type of like logical, active thinking process. Oh my God, that's amazing because you'll often hear people say, I don't know the difference between intuition and anxiety. If this isn't intuition mm -hmm. or fear, you know, I, I feel something could be happening, but is that just a fear that's activated? Um, right. Or is that something I'm projecting onto this particular situation? Yeah. So thank you yeah. so much for clearing that up. I would love to have you back on to talk more about that very thing because we yeah. do get a lot of people that we talk about. Um, I I am an empath and I do mm -hmm. strongly believe in stepping into your intuition. It's one of my passions, especially having yeah. ignored and ignored my whole life. So Ashley. Thank you so much for your time and your resources and, and for the way that you're plugging into this community and just pouring your heart into it. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's really been my pleasure. I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you so much for watching and all of Courage 365 and Ashley's information is in the description box. And if you want to be on the channel and promote your mission, your organization, or tell your story of survivorship, you can do so by going to my website, wendyrenee.com backslash tell your story and the schedule will pop right up. That's all we have for today. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.